Hello and good afternoon. We are here with the Cannabis Alliance. Um, I'm Kristen Baldwin. I'm the executive director. And today we're talking about uh, interview and resume skills for the cannabis industry. And on with me today is Trey Reckling, who is the founder of the Academy of Cannabis Science. He's helped train medical marijuana consultants in Washington State. I've taken his class and other industry professionals from the US to Canada. Trey's been working in higher ed for the past 17 years where he specialized in staff training, student development, conflict resolution, and crisis management. He served on the board of directors for the Washington Marijuana Association and serves on the educational, in fact, not just serves, but he chairs the educational committee for the Cannabis Alliance. He works with regulators, lawmakers, and governing agencies as an advocate of cannabis education. Originally from Savannah, Georgia, and you'll get to hear his adorable accent, Trey enjoys the Pacific Northwest and the freedom to explore and evolve the legal cannabis industry. Also with us today is Heather Dagley. She's a blogger at Bud and Blossom and the operations at the House of Cannabis. She's a blogger, a bud tender, and a lover of all things cannabis. She also serves as the Washington State Certified Medical Marijuana Consultant and Operations Man Manager at the House of Cannabis, which is a veteran-owned cannabis dispensary. And She's a lovely person and oh, always pipes up on our happy hours. Kara Bradford is Viridian Staffing. She's apparently the, she's not apparently, she is the godmother of cannabis industry recruiting. Kara has been an HR professional specializing in talent acquisition, talent management, workforce planning, employer branding, compliance, federal state employment laws, and organizational design for over 20 years. Her career has spanned multiple Fortune 100 companies and startups in a wide range of industries. Kara has a MBA in human resources and organizational development and is a LinkedIn PRC CIR. Well, I hope you can tell me what those things all stand for. CSSR certified. She has a master's degree in marketing and nonprofit management administration and sits on the board of a global recruiting organization. Kara is a frequent speaker at national and regional conferences in both cannabis and HR industries and heads up the NCIA's Human Resources Committee. She's been named the woman to watch by MJ Biz Daily Magazine. So we're all here this afternoon and we're just gonna be talking a little bit about, because it's gonna be an extensive conversation eventually, um, and in writing a resume and interviewing in the cannabis space, because there's some really specific areas and specific things you need to know that is very definite for cannabis. So Trey and I will be asking the questions and Kara and Heather will be giving us their vast knowledge to fill us in. So Trey, I'll have you start. Trey, you're I'm muted, I think. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. So, so, so first question to you. Uh, suppose I have worked in cannabis for a while, but most of my experience was pre-legalization. How do I address that in a resume without indicting myself? Kara, do you want to go first? I was Go ahead. <laughs> I'll go first and then you can follow up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question, Trey. So this is a really important thing to, to consider. And ultimately, though, you do want to make sure that you put your pre-legalization cannabis experience on that resume. This really could give you a leg up over other applicants. And employers are going to want to know if you've grown before, if you have this long-standing relationship with the plant. That said, I would advocate for really intentional language in the resume around that. Um, and there are ways just to brand this more professionally. So rather than using a term such as black market potentially, which might be colloquial, colloquially how, how we refer to that, you'll want to use maybe pre-recreational pre market. So it's all about how you frame that experience, but you absolutely want to get it on there. Excellent. Yeah, and I would I'd say a lot of times in resumes, um, people want to put that, um, you know, since we've been more commercialized, they want to put that uh, experience up towards the top. And so, uh, again, you definitely want that on there, but a great area to put that in. And so you maybe um, don't add as many bullets um, is to put it under, uh, go down to the bottom of your resume and put an area that says other relevant experience. And then bullet point under that other relevant experience that, you know, um, pre-legalization cannabis experience that you had. 
um, like Heather was saying, uh, maybe use things like confidential cannabis company and just list it as that or uh, co-op or cannabis family farm and just terms like that um, versus black market, <laughs> like she was saying. Um, so, you know, we still have an understanding of, okay, this person was working on a, you know, three acre outdoor grow operation um, and has that experience. Um, and we're not seeing maybe just your indoor grow operation experience that you've had since uh, since legalization happened. So we can see um, a more well-rounded picture of what your entire experience is. Great, thank you both. So how do you address the fact that somebody may have a prison record? Is that a big red flag? Um, and how do, you, how do you address that if they wanna get into the industry? Why don't we start with Kara first? <laughs> So uh, a lot of this is going to depend on the uh, municipality that you're in. Um, in several municipalities, you are not able to ask um, if someone has a record um, prior to the point that you have extended an offer to that candidate. Um, so it's an initiative called Ban the Box. So I would check and make sure in your specific um, uh, county or municipality, um, that that is, if that is a law or not, um, if you can even ask that question before uh, the point of, or um, before you've already extended them an offer. Um, now, is it a big red flag? Uh, honestly, it depends on what your record was for. Um, if it was for uh, a, you know, cannabis related um, uh, event that happened, um, Probably not a super big red flag. Um, if it was for theft or assault, that, you know, the employer may take some further consideration into that. So um, it's really gonna depend on what that record, um, that record is. But uh, I haven't, at least in my personal experience, I haven't had an employer um, look at someone um, once they did pull a background check um, decide not to hire someone um, because they had a cannabis related um, offense on their record. Beautifully said, Kara. I have nothing to add. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay, what if um, as a candidate person has management experience, they have pretty good experience, but none of that experience is in the cannabis industry. Should that person expect that they can um, be a viable candidate for something in management or would they expect to work entry level and have to work back to that point? Um, I'll share my two cents on this and then before we go to Kara. So, you know, maybe their record as a manager in a different energy, in a different industry really does speak for itself and, and perhaps they can go in um, as a manager and, you know, it might take a little bit longer though because there's going to be less job openings probably at that level open at a given time. So I would recommend that individuals that are really set on on entering the industry at the management level work with a renowned staffing company such as Viridian Staffing to to have someone that can help you advocate. But I do want to put it out there that maybe adjust your approach a little bit. I think people that want to ultimately end up in man management space you know, consider moving in to the industry in an entry level role, knowing that the value that you bring will ultimately get you promoted. This can happen extremely quickly in the cannabis industry. If you provide value and are driving solutions, you're going to end up where you where you ultimately want to be. And it might only take a year or so, depending on how fast you can show your value. So um, just two different uh, approaches to, to ultimately get to the same place. So I, I would definitely agree. Um, and, and just uh, what we often see um, is it really depends on the, the owner um, and what the owner's um, you know, uh, thought process is and what they're um, thinking they want the uh, work environment to be like. So I have some owners that um, come in and they're like, I only want someone with cannabis experience. And that's it. Um, and then I have other owners that come in and say, I want absolutely no cannabis experience. I want someone who comes from a company that has, um, exceptional customer service. And I'm like, well, there are a lot of cannabis companies with exceptional customer service, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but 
but you know it so it it's really going to just depend on um, the management and, and what their philosophy is uh, in terms of that. Um, if you are um, a management professional um, in Washington State, um, I will say because you know Washington State has been around so long, uh, most people are requiring cannabis experience, um, and and that's a, a must-have. Um, if you have no cannabis experience, but you're wanting to get into the industry, you may want to consider looking outside of Washington State just to kind of get your foot in the door and get that experience and then bring that experience back to Washington State um, once you have it. Because a lot of other states that are just starting, um, a lot of them are really looking for just really strong um, people managers uh, that can come in. Excellent. Yeah, we and we also are often um, encouraging our students to remember their transferable skills are are valuable and not to hide those, but to be to be, be uh, ready to talk about how they could benefit that company. Um, and then also, just some people don't have the vocabulary for cannabis, right? They don't understand the industry to know that we talk in um, eighths and quarters and ounces, or or what the endocannabinoid system is, or what is a cannabinoid. So. That's also where you know education is a is a great bridge, and uh, just so they can go in and, and speak with the language, because that that can be a barrier and certainly can leave people flat-footed in an interview. Cool, thank you. So, just looking at the resume, do I need to include references, and what kind of references would be good for this particular space? Kara, how about you start with that one? <laughs> Um, you know, I wouldn't, I would put on the bottom, just like you would with most resumes, um, references available upon request. Um, you know, I'll just be honest as a recruiter, when I see those references listed on the bottom, I'm like, oh, more candidates. Um, and so, <laughs> um, always recruiting. Um, so, you know, you don't, I wouldn't say you necessarily have to put them on there, but uh, you know, definitely maybe just a, a small line at the bottom that says references available upon request. Um, I do find that, um, I mean, we always check references on all of our candidates um, and uh, you know, have people actually just dedicated to doing nothing but reference checking um, because that is one of the key things that employers uh, do ask for in this industry. So um, I would recommend that you have those references ready and please call them and let them know that people are going to be calling them um, <laughs> because uh, it's, it's definitely not a good look whenever we contact those references and they either don't know that um, you've named them as a reference, which sometimes happens um, or it's a wrong number or what it may, whatever it may be. So um, just double check that those references are, are still good. <laughs> <laughs> Always handy. Heather, do you check references? Um, we, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with what Kara said too, like with the, the one line, but then having the references ready, they are ultimately important. A lot of people in cannabis are gonna ask for them. And I agree, make sure that you've done your homework and reached out sent a line to who your references are. And, you know, that might be tedious. It might be a little bit awkward, but ultimately it's a good thing. It's going to prevent an awkward situation. And it's another opportunity to tell these folks in your life what you're up to right now. So win, win, win. Win, win, win. Thank you guys. So the jobs out there are various in the cannabis industry and in all types of different positions. Can I make one resume and send it out to all? those companies or do you have a different recommendation? Please don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, um, but the, a surefire way to, um, so, and Heather can attest to this because she works for a direct um, plant touching uh, company. You know, sometimes you're getting 500 to 3000 resumes for one position. Um, the, the easiest way to, and you know, people don't spend much time with it. So um, easiest way to get your resume thrown into that circular file, unfortunately, is, um, well, now we just click on no huh, um, on, yeah. on our, uh, our various systems that we're looking at. But um, 
it is to all of a sudden I'm reading a resume and it says, you know, um, I'm looking forward to a position with XYZ company. Um, and it's not the name of my client's company. Um, and it's not my company. And so, um, it, it's just, uh, it's good to, um, be methodical about, uh, your resume and, and who you're submitting it to. Um, now I, I would say sending a resume to a staffing company and sending a resume to, um, an actual, um, uh, plant touching licensee that you're wanting to work for, um, two different things. Um, and we can go into that later if you'd like, but um, with the plant touching companies, um, you know, I, I would look at, um, okay, here's a list of 10 companies in the industry that I really wanna work for. Um, research those companies, find out, you know, what, what are their pain points? Um, what is it that they, um, if you're looking at a job description of theirs, um, you know, what is it that they say that they need? And then make sure that your resume addresses those issues. And ideally, up at the top of your resume, again, we don't have much time when we're looking at so many resumes. Um, so it's good to do um, kind of a bulleted list at the top of your resume that lays out, um, you know, those areas that you're an expert in, um, but it's good to change those bullet points around uh, to address whatever the job is that you're applying for. Um, so specific um, staffing company I would just uh, you know give us everything um, because you never know what experiences on that you have we might be able to you know appropriate into a different um, a different opportunity so um, you know lay it all out for us at staffing companies so we have all the information that we need I don't care if it's two pages or I would prefer it's not like seven, but, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, we, we want to know everything so we can see if there might be something that you did back in, you know, 1984 that would be applicable to now. Um, and that's important for us to know. Uh, but uh, customize resumes, especially when you're sending them to, to plant touching companies, please. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I echo yeah. that, I agree, like definitely don't want to regurgitate resumes. There's something, it, it's, it can be gleaned by the person looking at the resume when it was just another one and, and they copy and pasted for several companies. And mm -hmm. occasionally you will see that the wrong company name is even listed. So it just, it's not a good practice. And so similar to my response with, with regard to references, you know, this might be tedious actually having to customize your resume for each company you're applying to, but it, this is good. This is going to force you to be intentional and always audit. Is this really the right role for me? Am I going to get the right experience from this job? Um, and, and am I the right fit for this job? So you're always having to reanalyze that. And I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so if you use, if say, let's say someone uses cannabis recreationally, um, how do they share their love of the plant in a professional manner? We'll start with you, Heather, because yeah. you write a blog about this. So I do. There's no hiding it. And I think, um, you know, ultimately those of us, most of people that want to work in the cannabis industry, they might be here for some greater reason, right? There's a reason that cannabis has pulled them in. Yes, there might be more job opportunities, but they're there's a benevolent healing capacity of cannabis. And so I think um, you can speak to the fact that you enjoy smoking cannabis recreationally, but if you can tie it to any way in some greater, more benevolent um, passion, then, then you can speak to it all fluidly. And it doesn't always have to be like, oh, I think cannabis is gonna solve the world. You can say cannabis just makes me a happier person. And, and I think that through selling it or working with it, I'm able to provide that happiness to other people. So whatever that means to you, just be able to share your truth and, and, and why you love cannabis. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. I mean, you definitely, um, uh, when you're presenting uh, that to a client, uh, sorry, not a client, client for us, <laughs> oh, wow. uh, potential employer, um, you know, you want them to know that you're, you're passionate about the plant. 
Um, but you know, you also want them to know that you're excited about doing a great job for their company. So um, what I see a lot of candidates um, do, um, you know, to successfully articulate their passion is, you know, just go in there with the knowledge that you have um, about the plant um, and, and why it's, um, you know, why it is uh, important to you, as Heather was saying, um, but also just, you know, tell them about your knowledge and how you gain that knowledge, whether it's going through an educational program or, um, you know, if you did study on your own or however you gained that knowledge, um, be able to articulate um, that you have that knowledge. And, you know, typically um, they're able to gather pretty quickly um, that, uh, that you're passionate about it because of the knowledge that you have. Thanks, Guy. Suppose I'm an older candidate, just suppose. Um, <laughs> I want to I wanna minimize my years, my age maybe, but I want to um, focus on my years of experience. Uh, how do I strike that balance? And, um, you know, we know that can't legally keep me from getting a job, but what do I do to increase my chances? That uh, other relevant experience, uh area I was talking about earlier is a great way to um, put that experience down there, but maybe not list the years. Mm -hmm. um, so they see that you have that experience, but they're not focusing on the fact that you were working back in 1977 or, you know, um, even 1993 or whatever it was. Um, they're focusing more on, oh, I see that you did B2B sales for um, this company and that you successfully sold, you know, something plus million dollars. And they're focusing on that, um, which by the way, that's a pro tip to try to be quantitative on your resume when you can. Um, so they're going to focus on that versus focusing on the fact that you were um, doing that at a certain point in time. Thank you. Is cannabis uh, an industry for young people? What do you think, Heather? <laughs> I think there's definitely a lot of young people excited to get into the cannabis industry. Absolutely. Um, there, it is fun. It brings people together. And there's a lot of new and progressive ideas out there. And I think cannabis goes hand in hand with that. But there's certainly room for everybody. So I think old, young, if you have a tie to this plant, then, then this industry is the place for you. Good answer. Yeah, what, what I'll typically do as well is encourage that, um, you know, uh, I, I wish I could say we haven't had people before say, oh, well, it seems like they've been doing things for, you know, quite some time. And I'll say, well, think about bringing them in and how many people they could mentor over time to help, you know, basically share that knowledge that they've accumulated over the years. Um, do you have a mentor program set up? Um, and so working with uh, companies to think about um, ways that they can bring in people that do have all of that experience and have been doing it for many years and being able to elevate the, le um, the level of those, those younger folks in their company as well um, by bringing in that experience. So, um, I, mentoring programs are great. Um, I don't see them as much as I would like to see them. Um, I definitely haven't seen them as much in this industry as I would like to see them. Um, so I'm hoping that's something that companies will really start to, um, to you know, uh, as we, um, as the length of time of legalization um, continues, <laughs> uh, that that's something companies will start to uh, do because um, we've seen it be very successful in other industries. Yeah. And a big shout out to a lot of young people who are running, really doing the day-to-day -day running of these multi-million dollar operations and, and doing a great job. You know, people who are, are running a, one of the highest regulated industries in the world and just, just flexible and, and really caring. On the flip side, um, anybody who's dealing with the public needs to consider that the cannabis buying public is a very broad spectrum of people. And, um, and your workforce, I think, needs to look like your customers. And if all your workforce are 22-year-old peppy people, um, 
then, you know, I might not feel like your store is the store for me. So, you know, I just keep in mind, people like to be able to relate to uh, a variety of, of employees. And so don't, don't forget those older folks who are sometimes leading the consumer, some of the fastest growing consumer segments. Yeah, definitely. I've been really impressed by some of our um, younger clients who are running companies um, who have come to us and said, you know, I need a COO who has at least 25 plus years of experience um, because I'm lacking in that area and I need someone who can come in and, and help. Um, so I've been really impressed um, by um, just the, you know, um, their ability to kind of know themselves and know that they need to bring in someone with more experience to help the company succeed um, and kind of drop that ego, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, but uh, like I said, just been really impressed by some of the younger CEOs in the industry. Great. That's great. So I have, so if somebody has a medical marijuana consultant license, uh, how do they highlight that on their resume in order to kind of give themselves an edge up? Yeah. Kara, do you want to start and I'll follow up? I'll, I'll be really quick. Those bullet points I was talking about at the top. <laughs> <laughs> you love those bullet points. <laughs> um, definitely um, hi highlight that um, up there. Um, some people kind of put like a, a semi-title. Um, so they might say, you know, um, uh, medical marijuana um, license um, experienced professional or something like that. They'll put that at the top sign kind of as the title, um, but in the bullets is fine too. I at least usually get to the bullets. Just to <laughs> well, you <laughs> like the bullets, so yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if you can put those up there in the bullets, that would be great. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely relevant if anybody has their medical marijuana consultant certification absolutely advocate for getting that on the resume when you're in this industry. It shows that you've done your homework and in a lot of ways it shows that you've gone above and beyond. So, I mean, maybe your former employer has asked you to take the certification and sponsored you to do so, but a lot of bud tenders do this of their own volition and that's because they want to stay in the cannabis industry long term um, and they've decided I'm going to take it upon myself, maybe even not be paid for these hours of study. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a good way to show that you're here to stay and, and this is a professional place for you. And it also gives you an edge. You can use it now as your title. So the term bud tender, hate it or love it, you know, it does have a, ca a casual term to it. Um, and so in this way, you can now brand yourself as a medical marijuana consultant. Thank you. So we've addressed the resume. Now we're gonna move on to your resume actually got you an interview. And with all the interview jitters, there are some things we need to talk about that are specific to this industry as well. Um, and so I will have Trey ask the first, and maybe Trey, you can give a little bit, like what have your students um, felt about the interviews? Oh, well, I think um, interviews naturally make some people nervous to begin with, just like testing, you know, makes some people nervous. So, you know, we just, like I said before, encourage them to think about what are just a self-awareness exercise, you know, just making sure they know what they're particularly good at, um, what do they need some work on, and then how do you characterize that? Because, you know, you don't want to go and say, well, I have some time management issues, <laughs> but, you know, how do you answer those questions in a way that's honest, but aren't damning at the same time, you know? So I think uh, some of the coaching we do is just to help people get over their anxiety of the interview process themselves. But we like to remember or to remind them that um, this company needs a good employee as much as you need a good job. And the interview goes both ways. So they're not just looking at you, but you're also looking at them. And so, you know, don't be shy about asking questions and find out, you know, is this just a brohood company? You know, is this just a bunch is it feel like a fraternity? Because we have some of those issues in the industry or just male dominated workplaces or, um, or stoner mentality. And, and these might be a, you know, a small segment of, of some of the businesses, but maybe not an environment where you feel like you're going to flourish. You know, if your voice is not going to be heard and that sort of thing. So um, we try to help them think carefully about, 
you know, what, what they're bringing to the table. It's not just, um, they're not just the ones on the line. Definitely. Oh, on that front, if I could ask a question, what if um, I'm a candidate with a disability, what's the best way to engage about that so that you're paying attention to my strengths and, and not anything else? We could probably do a whole um, three hour session on this one question. Um, <laughs> it, it's a, a pretty, um, there are a lot of ramifications to um, potentially sharing that on, on both sides. Um, and so I'll be as transparent as I can possibly be um, in answering this. Um, as much as as HR practitioners, we coach and um, you know train our teams to not show bias um, when they are interviewing. Um, I wish I could say it doesn't happen. Um, unfortunately, I'll be honest, it does. Um, and it uh, so you know if you have a disability, you really um, don't need to necessarily disclose this. Uh, until you might need a comment an accommodation. So um, what a good way to approach this is, it, so if you do need an accommodation for an interview, so let's say for example, um, that uh, you aren't able to walk up and down steps um, or stairs. Uh, a good way to approach this is just to talk to the person who's scheduling your interview and say, um, you know, do you have an a, a, um, accommodation process, medical accommodation process? Um, most companies, um, shouldn't say most, companies should, <laughs> I'll say that, have um, basically a, a medical accommodation form that uh, you as an interviewee um, and then as a prospective employee can complete that form uh, requesting some kind of medical accommodation. So. Um, for example, the person who couldn't walk up and down stairs, uh, maybe you move that interview to the first floor instead of it being on the second floor. Um, and if that's a reasonable accommodation, so, um, and there's that definition. So I should say, I'm not an attorney. Um, so please talk to your employment attorney about um, <laughs> these questions if you're an employer listening to this. <laughs> um, but uh, if you're as most of you should be employee, potential employees listening to this, um, you know, just they should be able to make a reasonable accommodation for you. Um, if you're asking um, for something that isn't considered a reasonable accommodation and they can't do that because um, it's not considered reasonable, um, then, you know, that, that may be a further conversation um, that they'll need to have with you. But, um, you know, when do you bring it up? Um, typically, uh, uh, after I would bring it up after they've offered you the position. Um, if you don't have a um, accommodation um, request for the interview process, um, again, up to you when you want to bring it up. But uh, as I mentioned, I, I wish I could say bias didn't exist, but unfortunately, it does. And so I just want you all as um, prospective em employees to have the best chance possible um, to get the position. Thank you. Yeah. Only thing I'll add to that is, you know, Kara, absolutely, that you walked us through that timeline when to announce uh, or kind of disclose that you have is, is ultimately after offer. Um, so if you do have the interview and um, you're sitting down with this prospective employer, just use that opportunity to ask questions about the requirements that maybe you're concerned that you would or would not be able to fulfill. So you can gain all the information so that when you do ultimately disclose, you've got all the relevant information at your disposal and then you can work out the best arrangement for both parties. Great, great question. Um, one other thing to note to this too, and this is really difficult in this industry because we are so passionate about why we're in the cannabis industry, at least I think most of us are. Um, and so we want to tell our story and how cannabis has helped us. And um, we want to share that. And sometimes sharing that, again, may um, un cause that unconscious bias. Um, and so you want to be really careful in um, the interview, um, you know, 
if, if you're sharing what your love of cannabis is, um, that you're not sharing something that um, could potentially cause the interviewer to have unconscious bias um, against you. So um, just something else to be cautious about uh, when you're interviewing. Yeah, great. So what does one wear for an interview in this industry? How do I dress differently than I would for, let's say, Microsoft or Amazon? Yeah. Heather, you want to start? I'll, I'll start first, yeah. So some of my thoughts are, you know, cannabis can feel like a very ca casual industry. And in some ways it is. It is all about fun and happiness. And if you do, for instance, get a driver or bud tender role, it's very likely that your uniform will include jeans and a t-shirt most days but you still want to show up to your interview looking absolutely as professional as possible. Don't overdo it. I wouldn't wear a suit if for gentlemen. I wouldn't wear tights for women. Look business professional, um, but you know, showcase your personality and your style in the ways that you normally like to. It's, it's good to be yourself in these interviews. So um, try to balance all the above and uh, I think you'll do great. <laughs> yeah, I definitely... <laughs> I, I would definitely agree. And, you know, feel free to ask the company too, like what would be the most appropriate, you know, what is the dress attire um, at your site? Uh, I have unfortunately had, you know, uh, folks who have come up to me and said, well, you know, I, I didn't realize I shouldn't wear heels. And I'm like, you were going to a grow operation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you need closed toed shoes, and they actually could not go into the facility because they didn't have on closed toed shoes, but they were torn because they wanted to look professional. And so, um, you know, feel free to ask them, know if closed toed shoes are a requirement. Um, at any time you're in, um, a, if a, visiting a producer processor, you're probably gonna have to have closed toed shoes. So, um, you know, summer's coming, people want to wear flip-flops. I wouldn't wear flip-flops. So those things are, um, good rule of thumb is just to ask. They'll be happy to share that with you. Um, I'd be really surprised if they, they weren't. Um, if they weren't, please come talk to me. I'll go talk to them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's just, uh, it's good to be comfortable, but also know what the, um, if there are any restrictions because of the facility as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm a patient. I medicate daily. And some people medicate specifically for anxiety, which they would like to do before an interview. What, are, what would be your advice to somebody who says, hey, I just, I really need to do that before I go in? So this one is touchy. And I think that individuals need to balance their anxiety and their understanding of their body and ultimately what their goal is here, which is to ultimately go and get this job. So what you want to remember is you never want to show up to a job interview and look impaired. This really could, um, could limit your capacity to go and get this job. But if you know your body and you understand that taking CBD is always part of your normal regimen and it doesn't create any impairment or psychoactive activity and under the influence of this you feel good you feel like yourself and you can articulate your value then go ahead and do that so it's really just about that critical assessment is this going to help me get to where i want to be or is this perhaps a hindrance thank you yep no i would i would totally agree um and, and make sure please that uh <laughs> you I know especially, um, you know, folks get really excited because um, they get a call, they're asked to um, interview with a company. Sometimes those, that interview process, you know, in cannabis, everything we need right now. Um, so that all of a sudden that interview is 24 hours away and they're like, oh my goodness, I haven't tried their product in six months. I need to run out and grab a bunch of their product and try it. And then the next morning when they wake up and they need to go to that interview, there's a problem. Um, so, uh, because they didn't know how their body was going to react. And so, um, it's, you know, if, if you do want to go try the product, maybe say, Hey, I need about 48 hours before I can, you know, do this interview. Um, that way you can 
go try it and then uh, and then go to the um, the employer. But it's you know you definitely um, you know if you know you can then great. Um, I have again to be very transparent. I have some friends who when they are very high are more logical and reasonable than I am without anything. And so, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really just knowing what your tolerance is um, to, uh, but um, before you go into an interview, just like you would go into any other situation. Excellent. Thank you. So what, what should someone do if they don't hear back from a company they really want to work for? Is it any different in cannabis than it is in any other industry? Or Heather, do you get bugged by people when they call you? When should they call you? Yeah, sometimes we'll, we'll get some people that will call a lot. And um, I think tone is really important, though. Those follow-ups are key, right? And I, I'm sure Kara will agree. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this, too. But it, it's like the tone of, of your follow-up is so key, almost more than the act of doing it. So sometimes uh, applicants will call and say, hey, you know, have you, have you looked at my resume or I'm waiting a call back? You know, there's a different way to frame that. Hi, this is so-and-so. I'm super excited to apply to this company. I'm not sure if you had a chance to, to read through and, you know, just explain why you're enthusiastic about applying in the first place. And I think even if it's something out of left field during a business owner's busy day, they're going to be more likely to remember fondly that you followed up if you framed it in the right way. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Absolutely it does. Um, yeah, I mean, something that you all have to keep in mind, I mean, we do too. Um, at the end of the day, yes, they're you know, you all are applying for jobs, but um, you all are also our customers. And so, um, you know, especially the, you know, um, folks that are, are plant touching, um, you, you all want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, so following up is, is good, um, but, uh, you know, keep in mind that, you um, you know, the, the people working there at the company currently, they do have a job to do and they are super busy. And, um, you know, yes, hiring is important, but um, they, they have work to do too and they wanna keep their jobs. And so if you're following up too much, um, you know, that's going to, you know, cut into the time that they're able to do their job and maybe they were gonna get back to you, um, but you keep, you know, following up. So yeah, it's, it's um, when you're approaching, I would say any of the companies, um, a good thing uh, to do when you follow up is to um, number one, know about their products um, uh, that they have uh, or, or that you know that they're uh, selling. Um, do your homework uh, before you follow up. Don't just you know reach out with a um, you know oh where's what's going on with my resume. Um, follow up with, hey, I saw you in um, XYZ magazine, and I was reading about this, and I think that I really could uh, help your company along because this is my experience, and it looks like that you could use help with this. So um, just be thoughtful and, and methodical about how you're, um, how you're reaching out to, to these folks. Um, but uh, because like I said, there you all are our customers as well, and so um, we're we're typically going to be as nice to you as we can possibly be, because <laughs> um, we still want you to be a customer, um, even if we maybe don't have the right position for you at this time. And to call back to tone, um, I would add, encourage people, um, no matter who you get on the telephone when you do a follow up treat them with all the respect you would of the person who's making the decision because I know in my life before cannabis we've discounted candidates who called up and were rude or pushy with someone who quote just answered the telephone and uh, told us a lot about them as a person you know who maybe they were at their heart or who they might be on a daily so um, treat them all with respect just as, as we would hope you wouldn't have to remind. <laughs> Another good way to follow up too is, um, and obviously we can't really do this that well now outside of the Alliance Happy Hour, but um, 
you know, networking, you know, get out there and network. There's really, um, I hear all the time people when they're out networking and they're like, oh, well, I saw so-and-so at a Cannabis Alliance event. And then two weeks later, I was interviewing and had a job. Um, so, uh, you know, keep in mind that networking is typically the number one best way. If you're not hearing back from a company, find out, you know, is that company, you know, out a member of a certain organization or are they out doing, um, volunteer activities throughout the community and and basically be where they are um, so you can start networking in with that company you want to work with. Can I ask you a question about questions? Um, many people have been interviewed before and so they might have certain expectations about the kind of questions that are asked to them. Um, would they Should they expect something different from the cannabis industry? Heather, do you want to yeah, sure. I think in general, just there is going to be this element of why cannabis, because it is a newer industry, right? There's there's a lot of deep-seated industries in the United States, chemical manufacturing, things that people have been able to wrap their heads around. But now we have this brand new industry, only a few years old, and there is some stigma still applied, right? And unfortunately, so they probably just want to quickly get down to the bottom of why cannabis for you. And so a lot of the questions from my own personal experience and, and what I've seen in these other inter interviews is they'll want to get to the bottom of that topic. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And there, I see companies especially drill down whenever um, it's someone coming from another industry uh, because they... They want to know that you're not just gonna pop into their company for two or three months and then hop back to your other industry. So um, that question, you know, kind of the why cannabis, um, and especially, you know, a lot of our grow operations are in Eastern Washington. If they're moving you from Seattle over to Eastern Washington and relocating you and your family, um, they don't want to do that only for you to turn around and head back to Seattle um, or down to Vancouver a few weeks later. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that they're going to, if you're new to and wanting to come into the industry, um, that's something that you need to really be ready to and prepared to answer um, why it's, you know, why it's important to you and why you want to work in this industry. Um, you know, other questions that are um, maybe, uh, you know, different, um, you know, it just, I think it's not necessarily different, but um, they'll, you know, it's, it's about the job. And so since we have um, some, you know, differences in our position, our job functions in cannabis, um, some of those job questions might be different from other industries, but um, I don't know as though um, there are a lot of um, different questions that you're going to get asked um, outside of the, the white cannabis. Thank you. So how much research and what, and where can I research companies in this industry? Because often they, they don't really tell you a lot on their website about who they are, company culture, and what their pain points are, because it is so heavily regulated. How do I find that research, and what kind of research should I do? Yeah, um, the one big tool that comes to mind for for me is social media. Check out their social media feeds, and you can pretty quickly get a sense of what is important to them, uh, and and kind of what their aesthetic is too. Ultimately, that's going to be important if you do work there. But if they're talking about, um, you know, cannabis convictions and last prisoner project, that's something that you, you can cite when you sit down with your interview. If they're really focused on clean cannabis, then that's something you can bring up in your interview. And typically social media feeds are going to get you to the, the root of what really drives their business and what their goals are. Um, and then the only other thing I'd say is if they are a retailer, if it's a dispensary, check out their reviews on Google, get a sense of who they are and why their customers love them. And if you can speak to that when you sit down and chat with them, they're, they're gonna remember that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're, we also, there are, you know, lots of blogs out there. Heather has a blog. Um, you know, there are other companies, um, there are full media publications now like Marijuana Venture, um, Gondrepreneur, uh, marijuana business daily that you can go in and research um, these companies and, and get to learn more about them um, and you know some of these um, magazines and periodicals they actually leave their full magazines up on their website so you can just kind of go through and type the name of the company and the um, uh, the search bar and and see what types of articles um, that particular publication has. Um, even a quick Google search. Um, but uh, I would do as much research about the company as you can possibly do. Uh, sometimes there's information on their websites, sometimes there's not. Social media is definitely great. Um, you know, these publications though and blogs are, um, you know, where you can get a lot of that, that information though that may not, uh, be um, what their their PR companies and their branding companies uh, want you to see all the time. <laughs> so uh, kind of pulling back the layers of the onion, um, if you can, um, I would also uh, recommend going on to LinkedIn, um, speaking of social media, and um, see like who their employees are, um, how long their employees have been at that company, that's always a good tell. Um, if you see people that are there a few months and leaving and that's consistent, that might be something that you wanna take into consider um, or consideration. Uh, if you see people that have been there three years, five years, you know, a long period of time, that longevity is gonna tell a story as well. So um, just, you know, LinkedIn is a, a great tool to, to be able to, to go in and, and kind of find out that information about the company. Um, feel free to reach out to folks on LinkedIn too. Um, you know, click, just add them and say in a little message, hey, you know, saw you work for such and such, would really like to start networking with you on LinkedIn. Hope we can stay connected. Um, and it's a little bit more professional than you kind of adding them as a Facebook friend. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So uh, keep it to the LinkedIn network. Um, so that way you can, um, you can start to build those relationships with that, uh, that individual on, on LinkedIn and, and get to know more about their company that way. Are there cannabis companies on Glassdoor yet? There are. Yeah. That, I mean, Glassdoor is, um, <laughs> I have different opinions on Glassdoor. Um, so Glassdoor uh, a few years ago decided to start uh, monetizing themselves in a way so now you can pay um, to have reviews look better maybe than they should. So um, I, I always take Glassdoor with a grain of salt now since that started happening about four or five years ago, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So to follow up on peeling back the layers of the onion and finding out, you know, what is this company beyond their marketing message and, and that sort of thing. Um, once we've identified, hey, this is this is a good culture fit for me. What sort of questions or what can we do to show that we're a good fit for their culture? I think the, the research is the first step. So we've already gone through, we've done our research. Hopefully through that, we've been able to extract what their values are. Are they all about wellness or are they all about peace and kindness? So there's, most companies have these mission statements, right? And so then we can think about how to apply our own personality and our own values to those mission statement. Um, so sort of a one-two punch. But I think in general, just as you sit down and have this interview, Remember that you're having a conversation. These are people and this is cannabis. This is all about connectivity. So uh, be yourself and showcase that sterling personality. Make sure they enjoy their time with you. It's only going to help you in your application. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would just add, um, you know, as you're talking to them, ask, ask things about, you know, what is... But I mean, do your research before <laughs> is ideal, um, as much of it as you can. 
um, as Heather was mentioning earlier, you can tell a lot about culture from social, social media um, and see if that's going to be an environment that you fit into. Um, you know, if you see um, that that um, company is, you know, always having their outings going hiking and you're more of a, you know, stay at home person, then maybe that's <laughs> not going to be the, the right fit for you long term. Um, if, if that's something that it seems like the company is just constantly doing. Um, find out about, you know, their preferred communication style. Um, timeliness. I have some companies that you know, um, if they, if the person isn't on time all the time, then they're, you know, one time they're out. Um, I'm habitually five minutes late. I mean, that would not be a good culture fit for me. Um, so, you know, take, take those things and you have to be honest with yourself too. Um, I, I know it's really hard to do that because you just so much want to work in the industry or advance your career in the industry. And, you know, here's this job and it seems like things work out, but um, it, it's better for you to make sure you're finding a long-term fit than just a fit for right now. Um, because you never know when that person's going to end up being a customer of yours, um, a client of yours. And so, um, you know, it, it's better for you to say, you know what, I am always five minutes late. I know you all aren't going to like that. I wish you the best of luck in your search, but I'm going to go over here chances are you may end up getting that person as a customer or client down the road because you were honest with them and, and transparent that it just wasn't going to be the right fit for you. And, and down the road is a good point because this is a small industry. Even though it seems huge, the family can be small. And so uh, reputation follows folks, you know, companies and, and individuals. And so um, don't discount any interaction you have. They, they all count. I always say it's, it's the, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So think about it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. So what kind of stories about my professional past should I have be at the ready for the interview? What would, you know, what is the most, how do I bring up some compelling, and I know Kara, you talked about quantifying in your resume. Do you think quantifying, being ready to quantify in, a, in an interview is also good or do you want storytelling? I think you have to know the interviewer um, and know the company that you're interviewing with. Um, you know, having those numbers in your resume, um, I will say you should know your resume backwards, forwards in every which way um, because anything on your resume is gonna be fair game for them to ask about. Um, so if you're like, okay, I increased um, sales in this territory 50% year over year. Um, and then in the interview, you're like, oh, I increased them, you know, 75% year over year. Well, then you're, you're up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> um, so it's going to be, uh, you know, so, so definitely come in there um, prepared. If you have numbers in your resume, know those numbers. Um, and you know, I'm sure everyone's honest on their resume. So, um, you know, just, just remember those numbers um, that, that you have on your resume. Um, but, you know, again, it's just kind of knowing your audience. Um, and, and you kind of just have to get the feel for that in the first few minutes of your interview. If, um, if someone is, you know, pushing you on those numbers, um, you know, how many, um, how many pounds can you trim in a day um, or, and they just keep pushing you and pushing you on that. Um, then that's somebody you probably want to talk about numbers with. Um, if they're asking you about, um, Oh, tell me about the time that you built a relationship with this vendor team uh, with all these vendors and how you went about doing that. Um, then that person probably wants more storytelling um, and you can kind of, cover those subjects from there. But uh, again, it's just knowing your audience. And sometimes that's because I know you're nervous and <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, I have to think through all of this, you know, in an interview. Um, but uh, it's, it's good to practice beforehand and be ready. So if that person is more of a storytelling type person, you're ready to tell stories. If they're more quantitative numbers, data, um, analytical type person, you can, you can tell, um, talk numbers with them. 
Heather, how do you get people to get comfortable and, and be ready to be themselves and tell you who the, who they are in, in, a res, in an interview? Yeah, I think just kind of showing that you, you are interested in what they have to say and sort of disarming the situation. You know, this is a, people do get nervous for interviews, but just being a person and, and listening and, um, and sharing a little bit back, right? It's about a conversation. Uh, and I love, Kara, what you had to say about orienting to audience. That is so key. Are people relational or are they task oriented? That's what customer service is, but it really translates into the business world as well. How can I say what I need to say in a way that is going to be received well by the person on the other end? Because that is ultimately not, or that is ultimately my goal. That's not manipulation, that's influence, right? We need to use that. So, um, and I agree, I, I think what I like to do is just kind of have three to five stories and they can be quantifiable stories too, you know, where you went above and beyond. If there's any way that you can tell an interviewer that you understand what continuous improvement means and you have an experience or several experiences in your career that showcase that you can drive continuous improvement, it's gonna help a lot because they'll be able to, the wheels will start turning in their brain. Oh, if they did that at their last employer and the employer before that, will imagine what they're gonna be able to accomplish here. So have those stories at the ready. Don't sound robotic when you list them out, if you, even if you practice, just try to weave it into the conversation in an organic way and I think it'll come across. Yeah, and, and definitely also to um, Heather's point, uh, what I'll get sometimes is people will go online and they'll say, well, you know, they said that these were their, their four, um, you know, um, this was their mission statement. And so I addressed everything in the mission statement, but I still didn't get the job. And why didn't I get the job? And, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's, it's not, a dr it's not, you know, talking the way through the mission statement, but like Heather was saying, it's kind of weaving that through the whole conversation um, and pointing out, you know, if one of, um, you know, if something is about, uh, or one company's mission is to, you know, be really, um, you know, help, help out in the community, um, don't, you know, say, well, in your mission statement, it says to help out in the community, and this is the way I helped out in the community, just weave into the conversation how you've helped out in the community. So, um, but like Heather was saying, it's all about that dialogue, um, which is, uh, you know, and just having those conversations um, because uh, your interviewer is a person too. Um, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> and if I could add practice, you know, sit down and talk with somebody, you speak with someone you trust on the phone in person is better and let them ask you some questions. And because the more you say it and hear yourself say it, the, the better you tell that story. You know, I think this y'all keep saying story and I, that is so critical because they have to see you in that job, but, but practice, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have to lead to being robotic and, and, but keep in mind, you know, keep in mind that you're, you're trying to bring them along with you. So do y'all have any final thoughts? Uh, about these two, these, this area before we end our, our hour today? Heather, you want to start? I just want to say, kind of, I'll, I'll reiterate some of the things I said today, but be yourself, show your passion for cannabis, highlight your skills, and have confidence. Remember back what made you proud in your professional career. Proud, right? Lead with that. Have confidence. And remember that this is an essential industry now in Washington, right? It's here to stay. So have that confidence as well, that the industry that you are trying to break into or drive forward your career in cannabis, it's, it's, it's going to be here and it will be rewarding. So best of luck to anyone applying. Yeah, and I, I would just also encourage all of you that you know, this, the industry is vast and we have lots of opportunities in Washington. Um, but, you know, if there's not an opportunity in Washington um, and you're open to other states or even other countries, um, think about uh, going kind of outside as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in this industry out there um, and all sorts of different companies that di need different people. Um, like I said, we're, we're a little further along in Washington, 
Um, so if you are bringing experience from another industry into this industry and you're just not finding anything that says, you know, cannabis industry re experience required, um, you know, consider, consider other states because there are definitely um, folks out there that are looking for just really exceptional workers um, that can come in and do a great job. Um, it's an exciting industry, um, but they, they, it is a job. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that, uh, if, if you would have told me 10 years ago that, um, it would still be, um, this exciting and fun and amazing, but still a roller coaster, um, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, but I'm really glad it is. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's such an exceptional industry to be a part of and, um, couldn't, couldn't imagine doing anything else. Thank you. Trey, do you have anything to add? No, I would just, I think, emphasize uh, fit. You know, it's easy to say, Hey, hang in there for the right fit when you really need a job, but as much as possible, like y'all continue to say, find out more about that company, not just in what they say, but what they're showing. You know, do they have women and, and people of color on their board or in influential positions? It's one say to, thing to say we value diversity or we value everything. It's another thing to see what they're, what they're showing you. Um, because, you know, it, it's nice to have a job, but it's, it's hard to have a job where you don't feel like people hear your voice, you know, and, and there is another company out there that that will. So hang in. Don't feel like you got to put up with BS in the workplace just because you want to be in this industry. For real. Well, thank you, Heather, Kara, and Trey. I can't thank you enough. And look forward to other conversations around this area. Thank you. Thank you.